from Microbe TV. This is Matters Microbial, a podcast about the wonders of microbiology, microbiologists, and microbial centrism. This episode was recorded on December 13th, 2023. Hello, Micronauts, and welcome once again to our Quality Quorum. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Martin, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Today is the 21st episode of Matters Microbial. Can you believe it? I am grateful for every view, every listen, and every comment. I'm genuinely touched. First, the number one member of my Wunderkammer, a sculpture of a tardigrade made of, made of recycled metal parts. It was made by the great artist Brian Mock of Portland, Oregon, and it was a gift from Jennifer Quinn. I have linked to Brian's work in the show notes. It's really quite remarkable. It's finals week here at the University of Puget Sound as I record this podcast, and I'm thinking about my undergraduate research students whom are called Doc Martians. This is a title that a former research student of mine, Dr. Kim Dill McFarland, who's currently a bioinformaticist up in Seattle, came up with some time ago. In any event, here are last semester's Doc Martians, as you can see here. And honestly, working with research students is the best teaching I do. I adore it. And these students really light up my life, as you can see from this glow in the dark pen. I've spoken several times in this podcast about the role that creativity can play in education. My Bio 350 Micronauts created several things as part of their final exams that amazed me. And I don't know why, since they amaze me every year. They really are creative. One student created, naturally hand drew, this depiction of a mutant bacterium, which is avoiding a zone of inhibition created by a different species of bacterium on the skin. It's really quite remarkable. Another wrote a haiku about bacteriophage lysogeny, as you can see here. A third student modified a current and very uncomfortable meme showing an inattentive partner worried not about their partner in the meme, but instead about how many microbial fuel cells could power New York City through respiration. Spoiler, over 2 billion. Finally, I often remind my students why iron is so important to microbes, and this student drew a wonderful cartoon relating iron to cytochromes. It really is a privilege every year. Now, some folks find creative approaches flippant, and I do not. For many years, I've seen these approaches better anchor students to concepts and retention of those concepts. Plus, I'm a little bit too old and certainly too stubborn to change my approach. And I have a laboratory space filled with student-created art, which I treasure. I've known our guest today for many years. And I was thrilled that a number of years ago, she decided to show me what deep sea pressure does to a styrofoam coffee cup with this souvenir seen here. Also, in honor of coral microbiology, here is an old sample of, co of coral that I collect on, on a beach with a tartadoc on it. Now, marine microbiology has always been a fascinating subject to me, even though I must stay out of the sun and I do not swim well. There's so many wonderful microbial questions, and many folks are interested in what takes place with corals. It's much in the news, things like coral bleaching or coral diseases. So this whole business of looking at the relationship between microbiology and corals is a fascinating and really relevant one in our changing environment. And who better to tell us about quite a whirlwind career in marine microbial ecology than the person who I call Hurricane Chris, that is to say, Dr. Chris Kellogg of the USGS St. Petersburg Coastal and Marine Science Center in St. Petersburg, Florida. 
Welcome to the Quality Quorum, Chris. I understand you just got back from a research cruise and a work trip, so we're really grateful for your time. You bet, Mark. Happy to be here and, you know, always love a chance to talk about science. So I think a good place to start, if you don't mind, is tell the listeners and viewers a little bit about your path, which is a little bit of an unusual one. Um, so I guess you mean how my parents really wanted me to be a medical doctor, and it is 100% their fault that instead I became a marine scientist, because when I was three years old, they bought a boat and went sailing to the Caribbean and never came back. And so I grew up in the U.S. Virgin Islands, living on a boat with the ocean as my backyard. And so I kind of thought that my career choice was inevitable. And so I feel really fortunate that I now run a coral microbial ecology lab for the USGS, which the US Geological Survey is part of the Department of Interior. And maybe a different thing about than some of your speakers is that working for the government, I don't just do science that I find interesting or that's you know, basic or applied. Literally, we are the science agency for the Department of Interior. So the science and the data that my lab and other people at USGS create is actually there to support decisions that the Department of Interior makes to conserve our natural resources, including things like corals. That's really remarkable. Plus, I've been there to see all the aquaria with little pieces of coral and all the rest. So you have a number of things that you were interested in discussing with us today but perhaps we could start a little bit with a thumbnail sketch of what coral really is, and then later its relationship to microbiology. Sure. So corals, actually, I think I probably spent a lot of my first years at the USGS, because obviously the focus is geology, making sure people understood that corals weren't just rocks that didn't like to have sand poured on them. That in fact, there's this thin skin of tissue on top of the rock. In fact, the animals that are in it are building the rock sort of like their internal skeleton. And then within that tissue and on top of it in mucus are just tons of microbes. Basically, all of the domains of life are represented in a coral microbiome. So you've got eukaryotes, you've got bacteria, you've got archaea, and of course, you've got viruses that infect all of those as well as the coral host. And I've been really lucky in that over time, I study corals all the way down. So in that most people recognize uh, tropical coral reefs if they've gone on vacation and gone snorkeling. And I study disease and some of those. But then if you keep going deeper in the water column, so below scuba diving depths to 30 to 200 meters, which they call the mesophotic zone because it's the twilight zone where there's only a little bit of light, you get these light adapted tropical corals mixing in with some of the corals that don't have photosynthetic symbionts. And you need either technical divers with rebreathers or remotely operated vehicles. So robots on tethers to go down and actually collect samples or take pictures of those. And then I was unbelievably lucky to work on deep sea corals. So 200 meters down to thousands of meters where other than in a few places like fjords where you find a little bit shallower, you genuinely need either that robot ROV or a submersible in order to get down there and see what's happening and do the work. And I would never in a million years have thought that part of my career would involve doing submersible dives and seeing parts of the bottom of the ocean nobody else has, but it did. And it hands down was one of the coolest things ever. You've been in Alvin, haven't you? I have, which means I've also had buckets of ice water poured over my head. <laughs> So to follow up, I mean, this is part of government service that you're looking at with the USGS. So what is, what is their feeling about why this is an important area? So, you know, why corals matter? Um, or I'll limit myself for now just to shallow water corals because, you know, in the interest of time. And so it, coral reefs do so much. So, I mean, starting with aesthetics, you know, corals are beautiful. People love to go see them. And so from an economic perspective, there's a tourism aspect from a biodiversity concept. You know, there's they're supporting ecosystems of fish, of invertebrates, of all sorts of things. There's, you know, microbial biodiversity. You know, the next cure to cancer could be living on a coral that is about to die. Um, and then backing out from that, coral reefs, the reef structure protects our coastline from inundation and flooding from storms and hurricanes. So we're talking about lives and infrastructure that suddenly are at risk when you start losing corals to disease. 
I mean, to me, this is little different than talking about how important a particular forested area is. I mean, this is part of what, you know, holds us all together. Now, I was going to say that many people get their interests in coral from hearing about destruction of coral reefs due to things like bleaching, but I know that there are many coral diseases. But one of the things that really interested me is the idea of calling coral not just one organism, but a whole panoply of different organisms working together. So, but I know that the ones that people are used to seeing, like I saw in Hawaii and things like that, they, they have photosynthetic symbionts. Mm -hmm. Do the deep sea corals also have symbionts as well? So I, I would argue that all corals have symbionts. Um, the deep sea corals don't have photosynthetic symbionts because they live in total darkness. And also they live in colder temperatures and the traditional coral algae, zooxanthellae, have a thermal threshold where they like to be warm. So I guess you could argue that the tropical corals most people think of are the weird cousins that shacked up with algae because the majority of coral species are cold water and do not have photosynthetic symbionts. This is a critical point, Chris. Because we have a tendency, uh, you'll hear me call it, that we have a problem, we're eukaryocentric, we're oxycentric, we're coli-centric. And I think that this is true when we start thinking about light as well. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the majority of organisms on the planet, microbially anyway, certainly live in the absence of light and the absence of oxygen, which is an interesting way of thinking it. But we put our attention on the things that are more charismatic. So you began to study certain diseases of corals. Um, that was sort of, it happened by accident. So my real Please. interest is really, you know, in the whole microbiome, you know, classic microbial ecology questions. Who's in there? And what are they doing? It's just that sometimes what they're doing is causing disease. Please, um, how, did, how did you come into this? Um, so mostly I had started working in deep sea corals and for that, it was sort of, you know, I loved it because it was at that time sort of a wide open frontier because it is so expensive and so difficult to get a hold of samples. We knew nothing. And so that was great because anything you did was new information. You know, there's tons of species. We didn't know anything about any of their microbiomes. Most corals either at the species level or at the genus level have a different microbiome. So it's not like you can look at one coral and say you're done. You have to look at, at each of them. And so started studying those. And like I said, felt I'd kind of got off easy because again, you don't have the symbiodinium, the algal symbiont. So I thought, well, this should be a simpler system and the prokaryotic microbes should be doing more to sort of make up for that missing partner. And so I really thought it would give me a clearer picture of how corals and microbes writ large interact, because then it could inform trying to study coral disease. If you come in and the coral is already diseased, the whole microbiome is out of whack, and it's really hard to then backtrack and figure out what it looks like before it was diseased and what's going on. It's sort of like if someone took I don't know, a complex electronics like a laptop, bashed into a million pieces, handed you that and went, okay, so here, tell me about what this is when it's working and it functions great. And so I appreciate the ability to study, you know, systems that don't typically have disease or if deep sea corals do, we tend to not see them because we're only out there for certain points and try and use that information to better inform what we know about how it works when the system's working and use that to figure out maybe what's causing it to not work when you have disease. That's very interesting. I, I run into this with students a lot because we'll talk about what a human microbiome is. The fact is, it's like saying, what is a rainforest? Because there are different members of every rainforest, depending on where you look, when you look, how often you look. And and I think that that's that. And I believe people talk and I believe in your papers, you, you've actually talked about core organisms that are always there. And we, so that might try be and something find that again, just with the idea that if they're always there, maybe they're doing something really important. And that will give us a clue that then unravels more things that would be harder to figure out. Right. So it's certainly a moving target. Absolutely. So did you want to talk about deep sea corals first, or did you want to deal with a coral disease? Um, 
like I said, just to give you an idea with the, the deep sea corals, you know, I've already told you, you know, I love it because it's sort of a wide open field, lots to do, you know, not just for me, but plenty of people because there are more cold water coral species than tropical. And we know almost that, you know, there's still taxonomists defining the corals, much less the corals microbiomes. And it's just been interesting for all of the corals, shallow, deep, mesophotic, that, you know, for me, the microbiomes are interesting from a sense of trying to develop microbes as an indicator, because yeah. corals in general can't tell you when something's wrong. It's sort of like in shallow waters, you've got healthy. If we're upset, we change color, that would be bleaching, or we're dead. And in deep sea corals, if there's no algal symbionts, it's alive or dead. And dead is not a good metric of what's happening. And so trying to understand the microbiome using microbes as indicators of health so that you could get a sense before you get to dead. So it might look like it's okay, but could you find out, no, it's actually really stressed or it's hungry or it's not reproducing or, you know, and if it's stressed, is it stressed because of temperature or because of sedimentation? And so really trying to understand the microbiome to then move to the next level and be able to use either taxonomically or as, you know, groups of microbes, what is indicative of different health states? Because just looking at them does not cut it. I mean, obviously, I mean, it's the kind of thing, if you ask most people what they think about corals, uh, they're thinking about Bermuda, um, not Bermuda necessarily, but they're thinking about the warm, uh, the Great Barrier Reef. They're thinking about that kind of thing. And as you say, the vast majority of corals are actually deep water and only a few people, including you, study them. Uh, more and more uh, over time. It's interesting when, you know, I first came on board, you know, I had never even heard of these things and I was, you know, shocked. And I feel like over the last 20 years that I've been doing deep sea coral microbiomes, there has been more and more interest. And part of that is just socially people are, our needs are moving us into deeper water, whether it's for fishing, whether it's for oil and gas exploration, whether it's for marine mining. All of those things are moving into deeper and deeper water, and that's where these corals live. And so on the plus side, that means that if government agencies are saying, yeah, before we make decisions, we need to go look. We need to map where these things are. We need to understand these ecosystems, their connectivity, so we can make rational decisions about where we do certain activities and where we just draw a protective fence and don't. Earlier when we had a... Um a session with Pete Gurgis, the discussion of what the bottom of the ocean was like came up. And back in the Carboniferous era, when I was a student, the idea was, was mostly a, a dead area because there wasn't that much there. But in fact, with hydrothermal vents, we find out a lot of stuff is there. But what I'm hearing from you is you're also going to find these deep sea corals where perhaps people haven't looked as much as they should have. I, absolutely. I mean, I Personally, one of the, the first dives I ever did in a submersible, I was in the Aleutian Islands, and we were doing a dive at maybe you know 400 meters, which is pretty deep and in absolute darkness. And what I was seeing outside through the porthole was just this riot of colors, you know, pinks and orange and red and sea stars on top of things and sponges that look like lilies in a vase or a chocolate chip cookie. And just, it was crazy. And I, I would argue that if you took a picture and showed someone, they would assume that, yes, it was, you know, in, you know, Grand Cayman or something like there's unbelievable amounts of diversity. And so, yeah, these deep sea coral gardens or, you know, some people don't like reefs because reef is, you know, a impediment to ships. And obviously, if it's hundreds of meters down, maybe not. So it, coral gardens, coral ecosystems, but they are phenomenally, you know, diverse centers in the deep ocean where you not only have the corals creating three-dimensional structure, both hard corals, like the ones you had, you know, with stony skeletons and soft corals, more like sea fans, but you've got invertebrates, you see sea urchins, you see sea stars, all kinds of fish. A lot of them, fish use them as nurseries. Um, and then just in the soft sediment around them, you know, all kinds of things that are Bigger than microbes, smaller than people can see. So, you know, little shrimps, uh, nematodes, worms, polychaetes, just tons of life down there. The color thing is interesting to me because there, I, I know that, and, and you're going to roll, well, maybe you won't roll your eyes at me. I heard a story that if you cut yourself underwater below a certain depth, what comes out of you doesn't look red because that light doesn't doesn't reflect so it comes out kind of brown mm -hmm. 
And, and so when you think about what the colors are deep, is this color must not have much to do with signaling. Yeah, it doesn't make sense, right? Because, you know, there mm -hmm. is no light. We see it because we come down with huge cameras and lights in order to take the video. But yeah, why would things be that color? I mean, it sort of makes sense that some things are red because that's sort of like camouflage. It makes you invisible. But all the other colors, you know, why have those pigments? And, you know, some of them, it makes more sense that they're um, phosphorescent or bioluminescent. You can understand why something in the deep sea might want that. But just for the colors, it, it doesn't make any sense why they would be like that, why they would exert the effort to have pigments. Sometimes you'll have, you know, a white morph and an orange morph, and there's no difference between them genetically or sometimes even in their microbiome. So, you know, why? That's fascinating. So... I wonder if we could segue into disease in corals now. So that so that would be mermaids. So I laugh that the first time I was ever trolled on the internet on Twitter was when someone accused me of being part of a government conspiracy to conceal the reality of mermaids. And it was hands down one of the proudest days of my life. Um, and so because the government loves acronyms, when I formed the project I currently have that includes coral disease, I came up with the acronym MERMAID. So it was metagenomic examinations of reefs, microbial assessments, including disease. And I thought, surely this will be so obnoxious, management won't let me get away with it. And instead, everybody loved it. And so my really talented niece designed a logo for us, which, thanks to your good inspiration, is now on stickers that I have given to people. And so they're on water bottles and laptops all over the world. And so... That project looks at mostly stony coral tissue loss disease. And so, again, me and lots of other talented people working very hard to try and figure out what's causing it and how it's being transmitted. So it first appeared off Miami in 2014 and since then has spread through the entire Florida Keys and throughout the Caribbean. I'm wondering if the listeners or viewers could appreciate hearing how it looks different from coral bleaching. Sure. So to a certain extent, it's similar in that you see white. And I mean, the white in both the case of bleaching and in diseases is the coral skeleton. What's different is in bleaching, the algae have left, the coral tissue is still there. It's just you're seeing the skeleton through it. Whereas with coral disease, especially stony coral rapid tissue loss, the tissue is gone. And so there's neither zooxanthellae nor coral tissue. There is just stark white skeleton and it's white because of the rapidity of the loss because very soon after if you've got an empty space algae will grow over it and then it kind of looks yellow or brown or whatever and so it's basically seeing like a really sharp demarcation between color and then white whereas bleaching tends to be more diffuse and you'll have areas that are pale and areas that are white and so you know Specialists can look at it and know I'm not actually one of those because that's not my area. But for a lay person, I don't know that they would be able to tell other than white in a coral reef is typically bad. <laughs> when I was reading about, and I'm going to get the acronym wrong, stony coral loss, help me out. Stony coral tissue loss disease, SCTLD. It's fast. That I didn't know until I read some of the papers that, that you associated with this work. There have been other, and there still are, other coral diseases. What sort of made this more of an all hands on deck and was the real attention grabber is that, one, it affects so many species. So more than 20 reef building stony coral species rather than just a few. And the speed of the mortality, like you'd said, it could take sort of a basketball sized coral colony and from when you see the first lesion to the entire colony being dead is weeks to months. And so it was incredibly fast and it was affecting a lot of species. And so that was fundamentally changing reefs as it moved through them. Was there not a coral disease due to, and I don't know the right terminology for this, Chris, when we have an organism that jumps from one species to another, say something that causes a disease in a bat to a person, we can call that a zoonosis. Mm -hmm. But I believe there was something that happened off Florida with serratia that came out of sewage from human runoff. Am I misremembering that? 
No, there, there was. So it's, I think it was called white pox. And then, yes, I think they tried to change it to, I think, acroporid serratiatosis, but, you know, white pox is easier to say. And so somehow that didn't quite catch on. But yes, it was, there was a coral disease specific to um, acroporid, so the staghorn coral, and they did link a causative agent back to serratia from wastewater. That amazing to think of. We talk a lot about the effects of humans on the environment, and that was one that stuck out in my mind. Also, and I think this segues into stony coral loss, a lot of diseases people have an automatic thought are caused by one organism. But this may not be the case for some particular disorders or diseases. And I believe that's what you're finding now. So, again, huge international effort focused on this, really. And it's one of those things that most coral diseases are very difficult to figure out what, what causes them. So black band, which, you know, everyone likes because you can see it clearly, like even someone like me who only cares about the small stuff can clearly ID black band underwater. And it's a polymicrobial disease. So it's a cyanobacterium and a sulfur like vegetoa and a desulfovibrio. And only when you get them all together, do you get this sort of anoxic biofilm band that moves across the coral. SCTLD, we're still trying to figure it out. Like, I believe most of the community does, in fact, believe it is a multi-microbe infection. What we're not clear on is, is it all at once or is it like a cascade? And so it appears, again, from multiple people's work, not just mine, that there could be a virus involved and there's clearly bacterial involvement. And so we're trying to figure out, OK, it's there's a virus that has been appears to be associated with the zooxanthellae, although not always. And clearly the zooxanthellae being ruptured is part of the pathology. We see that on the histopathology slides, but it's unclear whether is it that something infects the symbiont, the zooxanthellae, which then causes a cascade and then it becomes a cellular problem, or is something infecting the cell maybe, you know, releasing toxins, which then impacts the zooxanthellae and then latent viruses come out. And so I think there's definitely multiple things at play, but rather than it being like a group attack, I think it might actually be a series. And we're trying to figure out what the series is and who, who, mo who moves in the water. Something is transmitted in the water. If we can figure that out, that would clue us into then who starts this. Would you mind would you mind if I asked how you would go about studying this? Because I understand how you can look at changes or differences, say a diseased area in coral versus a non-diseased one, what's the same and what's different? That's something that a lot of people do, but does that demonstrate the idea of transmission? And from what I'm understanding, you actually can study that. And I think the listeners and viewers might like to know how. So you're right. The, the very first thing I thought when this disease started happening is, well, OK, great, terrific in some ways that it affects so many different corals, because I told you each sort of coral has a different microbiome. And so could we look at all of the diseased corals and then healthy versions and look for something that was common to all the diseased and hope that the differences of the different healthy corals would sort of cancel out some of the noise? And multiple labs did exactly that using 16S and could not find a, any single thing. There was way too much noise across all of the, the samples, healthy or diseased. You could clearly see the difference between the two, but there was nothing that popped out and said, this is what's causing it. And so my lab was trying to come at it from, okay, we know there's something that moves in water. People had already shown that with tank exposures and we had seen it based on how the disease was moving in currents. And so what we did is we took healthy corals and sick corals and put them in buckets and let them create microbial tea. And then we took the corals out and used filtration to concentrate the microbial communities in the buckets and then used that to dose healthy corals to see, could we cause disease? And if so, we had size fractionated to try and see, okay, is it bigger than 0.8? So is it an infected zooxanthellae? Is it bacterial sized? Is it viral sized? Is it maybe the smaller than viruses, so less than 100 kilodaltons? Is it some kind of like chemical signal that's causing apoptosis? And so we trialed all of those different things separately to try and narrow in on a size fraction that might tell us 
which sort of microbial group we should be looking at. And nothing is simple. Uh, we did this three separate times. There was a hurricane during one. We ended up with resistant corals as our test subjects on the second one. It, nothing was ever clean, but we ended up figuring out it was not the small viruses. So anything that would go through a 0.22 micron, so anything smaller. However, the viruses people later started seeing in the histology slides were long and filamentous. And so I could see them being caught on top of the 0.22. And so it could have been viruses like that, or it could have been bacterial, but it does seem like it's something in that size fraction, not something bigger like a ciliate and not something smaller like a you know round virus. And so we started narrowing in on that and have since been trying to you know pick away further at, can we separate those things out? And that kind of got stalled because the massive bleaching event this summer meant it was impossible to lay your hands on healthy corals to do any kind of challenge tests. So another question I wanted to ask, if you don't mind, is imagine that you have an outbreak of SCTLD. Is there anything that can be done about it? So right now, again, since we're still struggling to figure out what it is and how it's moving around, there are um, efforts to stall it or stop it. And so, in fact, they found that in amoxicillin, so an antibiotic paste applied to the lesion will sometimes stop it. Not always, sometimes it reoccurs. And it's of course very labor intensive and you don't wanna be putting antibiotics all over the reef, but in discrete usage on the lesions, especially for huge iconic colonies. So corals that we know just based on their size are literally hundreds of years old. They are using antibiotics to try and stop this disease because you save more coral by preserving that than losing it and then trying to replace it with restoration pieces that are this big and are gonna need hundreds of years to catch up. So it's not a perfect solution. It doesn't always work, but it works well enough that we are using it at least in the Florida Keys. And I know some islands of the Caribbean are using the amoxicillin paste as an intervention. While, because we couldn't wait to make sure it's the best answer, we had to do something. I, I believe I read something about some folks, and it might not be this particular coral disease, talking about the use of probiotics? Absolutely. I know several groups that are in the process of trying to develop probiotics. And yes, there definitely is, are groups looking at that for SCTLD. And it's interesting because we talked about this as a polymicrobial disease, and it makes me think a little bit about the solution needs to be ecological. So the idea of, of like dropping a cluster bomb on an assemblage of microbes, which is what antibiotics kind of do, it might be necessary, but very, but thinking about an ecological solution by figuring out the, restoring the correct community would be the ideal situation. In, indeed. And, and again, you know, I think part of why Florida and the Caribbean has been hit so hard is again, it's a high stress area for corals. There's a lot of population. There's a lot of nutrient pressure. And so, yeah, maybe part of it is water quality. If we decrease the pressure on the corals and their immunity was better, then that might help not just with one disease, but all the diseases. And that's always a constant thing that the community talks about. How do we affect that change while also trying to directly handle the disease? So that's what Mermaid is about. Mermaid is about a, a, a platform for looking at the differences that one might find in different types of assemblages. So you can say, all right, I'm looking at this group of corals over time, and I'm seeing patterns mm -hmm. of change that take place that are associated, say, with normal growth. And then I have others where there might be something that looks like they're stressed. You try to see what's different than the same. You know, I worry about the directionality of it, right? But still, I mean, how else do you study it? Have you found other things from Mermaid that that really surprised or excited you? Um, well, I think I had told you it's sort of as a spinoff and again, finding silver linings and things. So, you know, SCTLD is a horrible disease and has spread rapidly and has fundamentally changed, you know, reefs in the Caribbean. But because of that, we created this large international network of people who cared, you know, 
researchers and reef managers from, you know, all over all these different island nations, everybody. And because we had that network, when another disease popped up, we were able to get in front of it in a way that's like nothing I've ever experienced. And that was the sea urchin mortal mass mortalities. So uh, yes, in the 1980s, Tell us more. there was a sea urchin die off across of diadema antelarum. So it's the black spiny urchins with really long spines across the whole Caribbean in like 82, 83. And we never knew what caused it. And I mean, I was, you know, in the Virgin Islands when this happened, I remember there being tons and then there being none. And so slowly, both with help from people and naturally the urchin populations had started coming back, but very little. And then in January of 2022, someone saw this, in, you know, they found a pile of spines and tests, like something had come through and had rapidly caused urchins to die. And because we had this community already in place, connected and talking to each other, immediately website got set up. People started sending in, you know, where they'd seen it, if they had seen it. So we were getting reports on the ground from people. People were preserving samples every possible way, because again, we had no idea what it was. So preserving for, you know, for microbial, preserving for chemical, for anything. We had no idea what was causing it. And so all of that jumped into action. Uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Ian Hewson, sort of took the lead on this since he had worked on sea star wasting disease. And so he had some experience with, you know, invertebrate mass mortalities. He was getting samples, you know, sending out sampling packages, collating them. He started doing sequencing and started pulling out metagenomes and transcriptomes that unbelievably started showing a likely suspect. It was a ciliate. And at the exact same time, other collaborators who are histopathologists were looking under the microscope and seeing in diseased animals a ciliate. And so pulling those two lines together, and we, this was happening like in real time with, you know, independently compared notes and went, okay, this might be what we should be looking at. Ian was even more lucky. He managed to get this thing in culture. And so at that point, our mutual friend, uh, Maya Breitbart, and I convinced him to come to St. Pete to use some of those aquarium facilities you've seen. And with that culture, we did challenge experiments and fulfilled Koch's postulates, which in my career, like had never really been done well for a marine invertebrate disease ever. And so in four months, we went from, we have no clue what's happening to, we know what did this. And it was only possible because of this incredible international team. I mean, it was like being in a summer blockbuster, like the Avengers, like everybody dropped what they were doing and came together and made this happen. So a, a couple of things, and I want to I want to clarify for the listeners and viewers, I'm a ciliate is a protist. That's mm -hmm. a eukaryote. And, and they're funny eukaryotes because many people think of them as having all the parts of, of an animal, but of course they're single celled and paramecium or amoebae are the kinds of things that people are used to. Secondly, the idea of metagenomics is always a fascinating one. And when you're looking at all of the DNA, all of it, no matter where it's from, and using quite a bit of computer time, it's possible to bin those out to find out who's there, even if you can't grow it. Yep. That's the important thing to keep in mind. Transcriptomics, what genes are being expressed, even when you can't grow the organisms involved. Also, many people are used to the idea of scientists publishing with one or two authors. That's certainly, and it still happens from time to time. But some of the most interesting things coming out have a lot of people involved, as you've just alluded to. And so now you have this huge and enthusiastic group that are all working together. And that's a wonderful story about the way science can be done. Yes, I actually, when we announced the paper for, for Twitter, I actually made a movie poster style um, announcement where I took, you know, where you can see all 49 of the authors and you know, use the tagline, you know, who will survive and what will be left of them, which, you know, people who are old enough will recognize from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But when you saw what, you know, the piles of dead urchins with just spines looked like, that was exactly what I was thinking of. But yeah, in, in like incredible representation, like I said, across agencies, across countries, you know, anywhere from senior scientists down to grad students. And I'm going to take this moment to do a shout out to Ian's PhD student, Brian Villanova Cuevas, who not only is a force of nature and has been working on this project, but I know from Twitter is a huge fan of this podcast. So that's going to be an Easter egg for him to find. 
Well, that's that's a wonderful story. And, you know, someone might kind of look down their nose and, and they might say, well, a ciliate isn't exactly, you know, a bacterium or a virus or a eukaryote, but I don't care because it's still tiny. And the majority, I, I got too far, too far forward on that. And a lot of ciliates contain lots of bacteria inside themselves as symbionts themselves. They do indeed. And that's something that Brian is looking at to see whether that has something to do with why this happened. So you, you must be familiar with the killer, which is these, uh, it was discovered in the 50s. Paramecium, uh, there are certain types of paramecia that have mating types. And killer was where they would mate and then one of the recipients would then die. Mm -hmm. And people said lots of things about that, you can imagine. We, yes. we live in, in better times today. But, it, but what that was responsible for is that in one of the uh, partners, um, there was a symbiotic bacterium that was making a toxin. Now, the organism that carries it is resistant to it, but the one to which it conjugated, that's probably the better word to use, was not. So this, I, I like to think of protists as being kind of vectors for lots of, like insects, they have lots of bacteria inside them. So that's fascinating. And I love the Easter egg. Well, and so it was funny because while ciliates aren't, you know, unknown, they've been associated with some coral diseases, they've been associated with other things, but they're almost always secondary opportunists. And so part of why we had to be able to fulfill Koch's postulates was because it was otherwise no one was ever going to believe that this was truly the pathogen and not just something that showed up later. Oh, I agree. And, and I mean, this idea of disease as a process is an interesting one to me, because again, you know, we tend to think of one organism infecting and carrying on. Are you familiar with Arturo Casadevall? Yes. So Arturo doesn't care for the term pathogen. And, and the reason that he doesn't, it, and, and I want to say this to the listener and viewer, the best way to think of this is we all have visceral ideas about what these words mean. Um, to a real estate agent, everything is location, location, location. Mm -hmm. And what Arturo is saying is that when you talk about an organism that can cause disease, it's always context, context, context. Absolutely. An example, there are some bacteria in our gut that make vitamin K for us. But if we, I don't mean to be graphic, if we have some kind of accident that spills some of the gut contents into the peritoneal cavity, that bacterium, which normally has a positive effect, will turn on the host. So it's context. And, and this is what's interesting about what you're bringing up with me, the idea of disease as a process mm -hmm. with players that come in later and earlier, almost the way that, say, fermentation works, where you have a series of different ecological shifts. And that might be something that's taking place here to some degree. And that is certainly a paradigm shift. Um, I mean, I definitely in in coral diseases. So both the ones we have a better idea of and ones like SCLT, SCTLD, where we're still fighting it out. We know that that's that there's a successional thing. And that's part of the trick, like I said, of trying to figure out who starts it, because clearly by the end of it, there is a very sort of distinctive secondary opportunist bloom of certain species that come in. And are they, you know, are they part of the disease? Yes, but did they start it? No, they came in after there was suddenly this bonanza of tissue and nutrients and, and the party had started and so in they came. So, you know, are they completely guiltless? No, they didn't start it, but they definitely helped finish it. That's amazing. And, and as I say, even though I think many medical microbiologists would, and I'm not going to say ignore this, but they wouldn't spend time thinking about this. I think there's something to consider. Even when we talk about, um, and, and there I go, I'm going to use the term pathogen again, and I don't mean to. You know what's funny about that, Chris, is a student of mine, I had them do a response uh, about one of Arturo's papers, mm -hmm. and the student wrote something up, and they made kind of a misspelling. And sometimes the error that they make is actually quite clever. And rather than pathogen, the student wrote pathogon. And Arturo thought that was an awesome mistake, and I agree. 
So that's kind of, and I'm not saying that's the way that that every disease that you're going to look at works, but it's an interesting way of looking at things. I'm thinking specifically about people who look at periodontal disease, mm. where it's clearly a bunch of different things working together. And it and it certainly is going to change the population over time. So that's something more of a time. And that might be, with all due respect to black band disease, something that might be more relevant to a large entity like coral. It, for sure. I, I've noticed like in the coral community at large, there's really been a move to sort of try and look at, at disease and even, you know, as a, a triangle. So it's the host, you know, how is its immunity? Is it more susceptible? Is it, you know, stress from temperature or nutrients or something else that makes it, you know, vulnerable, which then is the environment. So that temperature or nutrients or some other pressure and then the microbe and where it is. And it's where those three things cross over that you end up with this disease state. Amazing. So let's see, we've talked about Let's see. We've talked about deep water corals. Hmm? We have talked about, and I'm going to mess it up again, SCLTD. Close, right? Same letters. Yeah, that's 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 right. And yeah, I, I won't even make no, a, a it, joke about it. It took all that. of us about a year and a half to get there. And it's funny. Initially, people didn't spell it out, so they tried to make it a word. And so I think I, you know, because again, there's no vowels, but you try and put them in. I lobbied for scuttled because I felt like that was an appropriate description of what was happening to the coral. It did not catch on, you know, like fetch. I couldn't make it happen. Yeah. For a while, people were calling it skittled or skittle D. And I think the decision was made that that made it sound too much like candy and people would not understand how awful it was. And so currently now we just go with the letters. <laughs> I could have written them here. That's what I should have done. <laughs> so and, and then we move from that to mermaid. And I, I love the idea of mermaid because it's it's like a, a good bin and you bring all these groups together to do it. It's wonderful, a network. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about, I was going to say sea star. No, I don't mean the sea star die off. Um, when you're talking about urchin die off, the way you did due to a ciliate and fulfilling Koch's postulates with a protist, that's amazing. Do you have any other stories you'd like to share with us about about what you do? Um, I, it may be, it was funny. You'd said there's one question you ask everybody, you know, what yes. was the defining moment that, you know, made them a microbiologist? And it's funny yeah. because I was sort of thinking about that. And it, the story is that one, it snuck up on me. So I had, you know, gone into college, you know, gung ho for marine science while my parents were, you know, hoping desperately that peer pressure would sway me into medical school. And at no point in my small, Island High School, did we have a microbiology class? And while I'm sure there probably was one at my college, I I didn't didn't notice it, never took it. So I, you know, I was focused on you know marine science. I remember taking you know genetics and maybe invertebrate zoology, but never took microbiology. And so at the end, when you know literally every other bio major was going off to med school and I was having to apply to graduate school because a professor took me aside and said, oh, that's what you could do. You don't have to go to med school. And I'm writing an essay and the essay was, you know, asked me to talk about what scientific things did I find interesting. And so I sat down and I went, well, let's see, in my marine biology class, we had just read, this was, you know, 1990, 1991, we had just read about this like breakthrough by Jed Furman and Lita Proctor, where they had discovered there were, you know, 10 to the seven viruses in a drop of seawater. And what were they doing? And so I thought that was fascinating. So I wrote about that. And then I brought up, you know, having lived through the 1980s sea urchin die off, never imagining in a million years that I would get to work on something just like it later and how that was interesting. And then I talked about bioremediation and how I love the idea of being able to use bacteria to clean up like oil spills or chemical spills or whatever else and sent this off. The embarrassing thing being that my 20 something year old self in no way connected all of those things as being microbiology. They were just, these are things that interest me. Now, thankfully, on the receiving end, people didn't know that I hadn't connected those dots and went, oh, you should come join this marine microbiology lab. And so I got there. And so apparently I feel like I had all these ideas and sort of like that video you have of the ice nucleating bacteria, it just sort of crystallized around me when I hit grad school. And it's like, oh, I, I'm a marine microbiologist. <laughs> 
Well, the student, the students I have joke about it. Like they come into the lab and they'll say, you know, I'm, in, I'm interested in this stuff, but I don't want to be a microbiologist. Flash forward a few years and, you know, they're converted. That's well, because again, it's awesome. It, the, the beautiful thing, and, and this is something that, that ASM has put out, you know, it's the microbial sciences and what fits under that giant tent is enormous. You know, it's not necessarily classical cultivation-based microbiology, even though, you know, I do do that and it's really cool. You know, there's all of the molecular biology. It branches out into immunology and into genetics and just, you know, food science. And like, the, you know, I feel like there's almost no science that you can't connect to through microbial sciences. I, I, um, I don't want to point fingers or, or be difficult, but I know of an institution where the people in the chemistry department called themselves as a tagline, the central science. And I, I didn't bite my lip. I didn't say anything unpleasant. M my wife, Jenny, a mathematician, took issue with that a little bit. But I could make a case for microbiology really being super important. And the fact is, most places we don't teach it as if it is. And it's very interesting that I do that and to watch students make kind of a change in the way that they look at things. And I, I think it'll be helpful in the future. Um, you, you mentioned a big tent, I would argue a big Petri dish. But yes, I totally agree that it is it is truly to me, you know, one of the most interdisciplinary sciences because it connects mm -hmm. to so many things. It underlies everything. You know, they're in us, they're on us, they're in the environment. You know, you've seen those you know things where it's like if you removed everything but the microbial biomass, you could still see this outline of all the things. And so, yeah, how could it not be the center? Oh, I agree. I mean, that's why I first evolved last extinct. That's what I always say about it, right? Well, Chris, it has been wonderful to have you on this podcast. And as I said, people can see that you have a lot of enthusiasm. You have a lot of drive. You have a lot of energy. My feeling is you have a switch all the way on or all the way off. I don't know if that's true, but that's my guess. That um, probably I don't know that there's ever an all the way off. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has been a pleasure to speak with you. I Always enjoy seeing you. I'm glad I was able to visit Tampa and actually see your digs at one point, and I hope to be able to do that again sometime. Yep. So we'll I want to thank sunscreen. You'll be fine. <laughs> no bigger hats, right? That's what I need, or an umbrella. I could. I, that's that's my goal. I could goth my way out, right? So thank you so much for being on the podcast, and it really means a lot to me that you were here. My very best to you and yours. Oh, and. Happy holidays. We're almost there. Almost there. Thanks again. You bet. This has been Matters Microbial, a weekly podcast about the wonders of our microbial world and the people who study it. You can send questions, suggestions, or comments to me at mattersmicrobial at gmail.com. Show notes from today's episode with, as usual, tasty, tasty links can be found at microbe.tv slash mm. If you like our work, please consider supporting us at microbe.tv slash contribute. I'm Doc Martin, and you can find me in the biology department at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Dr. Chris Kellogg can be found at the USGS St. Petersburg Coastal and Marine Sciences Center in St. Petersburg, Florida. Many, many thanks to David Renata for as usual superb editing and ideas, and Reber Clark as always for the wonderfully quirky music. I hope you've enjoyed being part of our quality quorum today. See you next week on Matters Microbial. <laughs>